Jacob's experience with angels. According to the book of Genesis chapter 25, we learn that Jacob deceived his older brother Esau into relinquishing his position as the eldest son to their father Isaac. It turns out that all it took to convince Esau, starving at the time, to give up his inheritance to Jacob was a bowl of soup. And in Genesis chapter 27, Jacob again upped his game by pretending to be Esau to trick his elderly and nearly blind father into giving him his blessing. These lies gave Jacob access to the material and spiritual blessings passed down through the family lineage. It is essential to remember that Isaac was himself Abraham's son, and Abraham was the person with whom God had previously established a personal covenant. As part of the promise that God made to Abraham, his offspring would not only inherit the land of Canaan, but they would also become as numerous as the stars, eventually becoming a powerful nation that would be a blessing to the entirety of the world. Genesis chapter 12 verse 3 And I will bless, do good for, benefit those who bless you, and I will curse, that is, subject to my wrath and judgment, the one who curses, despises, dishonors, has contempt for you. And in you, all the families, nations of the earth will be blessed. As you might expect, Jacob pinching this blessing and birthright from Esau caused a bit of tension between Jacob and his older brother. Because of this, the Bible says Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Genesis chapter 27 verse 41 And Esau was determined about this. Learning this, Jacob and Esau's mother Rebekah sent Jacob away to seek sanctuary with her brother Laban. There, with the blessing of his father, Jacob would hopefully find a wife and be able to start a new life, safe from his brother's rage. Genesis chapter 28 verses 10 to 12. Now Jacob left Beersheba, never to see his mother again, and traveled toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed overnight there, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down there to sleep. He dreamed that there was a ladder, stairway placed on the earth, and the top of it reached out of sight toward heaven. And he saw the angels of God ascending and descending on it, going to and from heaven. Jacob set off on a journey toward the ancestral grounds of his grandpa Abraham and his mother Rebekah which were located further to the east. We read, Then he dreamed. Jacob had a crucial dream as he was sleeping in this barren desert. He was using a stone as a cushion at the time. One can only imagine Jacob's strange flood of feelings at this moment. The fear, the loneliness, the isolation, the excitement, and the anticipation. This was an important time in Jacob's life. A ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. In his dream, there was now access to heaven. Jacob now knew God was closer than ever before, and there was genuine access and interaction between heaven and earth. The God of Bethel is a God who does concern himself with the things of earth, not a God who shuts himself up in heaven, but God who hath a ladder fixed between heaven and earth. Spurgeon Jesus made it clear in John chapter 1 verse 51 that he is the access to heaven and the means by which heaven comes down to us and we can go to heaven. John chapter 1 verse 51 Then he said to him, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, 
you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, the bridge between heaven and earth. Jesus is the way to heaven. John chapter 14 verse 6 Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. Jacob had no doubt heard about the great God who appeared to Abraham and Isaac. But now, this same God met Jacob personally. This was a life-changing experience for Jacob. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Jacob was in need of consolation and hope at this pivotal juncture in his life, and these words provided both. God restated to Jacob the conditions of the covenant that he had previously established with Abraham and Isaac. Before, Isaac told Jacob the covenant was his, but now the voice of God himself confirmed it. God promised him land, a nation, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and a blessing, in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis chapter 28 verses 3 and 4 May God Almighty bless you, and make you fruitful and multiply you, so that you may become a great company of peoples. May He also give the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the promised land of your sojournings, which he gave to Abraham. I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you, until I have done what I have spoken to you. God gave to Jacob the same kind of promise found in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God won't let us go until his work is complete in us. We read, Behold, I am with you. That God should give to Jacob bread to eat and raiment to put on was much, but it is nothing compared with I am with thee. That God should send his angel with Jacob to protect him would have been much, but it is nothing compared with I am with thee. This includes countless blessings, but it is in itself a great deal more than all the blessings we can conceive of. Spurgeon God's blessing and faithfulness to Jacob is seen in the several ways that his presence is described in Jacob's life. Behold, I am with you. Genesis chapter 28 verse 15 This describes present blessing and the indescribable blessing of God's presence. I will be with you. Genesis chapter 31 verse 3 This describes the wonderful promise of God's future presence and blessing. The God of my fathers has been with me. Genesis chapter 31 verse 5 this was Jacob's testimony of God's faithfulness and presence with him. God will be with you. Genesis chapter 48 verse 21. This was Jacob passing on the blessing of God's presence to the next generations. Genesis chapter 28 verses 16 to 19. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, Without any doubt, the Lord is in this place and I did not realize it. So he was afraid and said, How fearful and awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gateway to heaven. So Jacob got up early in the morning and took the stone he had put under his head, and he set it up as a pillar, that is, a monument to the vision in his dream and he poured olive oil on the top of it to consecrate it. He named that place Bethel, the house of God. The previous name of that city was Luz, 
almond tree. Jacob was right in sensing the presence of the Lord there. King David knew that God was everywhere. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Psalm chapter 139 verse 7 Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? He called the name of that place Bethel. In the course of Israel's history, the city of Bethel would play a significant, though not very glamorous role. It is the second most mentioned city in the Old Testament after Jerusalem, making it the second most important city in Israel after Jerusalem. In a later conversation with Jacob, God introduced himself as the God of Bethel. Genesis chapter 31 verse 13 I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar, and where you made a vow to me. Now stand up, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. In due time, Bethel will rise to prominence and become famous as a site for offering sacrifices to various idols. 1 Kings chapter 13 verse 32 for the words which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel, and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria, shall certainly come to pass. Hosea chapter 10 verse 15 In this way, it will be done to you at idolatrous Bethel, because of your great wickedness. At daybreak, the king of Israel will be completely cut off. Amos chapter 4 verse 4 Come to Bethel, where the golden calf is, and transgress. In Gilgal, where idols are worshipped, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Genesis chapter 28 verses 20 to 22 Then Jacob made a vow, promise, saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take, and will give me food to eat and clothing to wear, and if he grants that I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone which I have set up as a pillar, monument, memorial, will be God's house, a sacred place to me. And of everything that you give me, I will give the tenth to you as an offering to signify my gratitude and dependence on you. He says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 The Lord is good, a strength and stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows, he recognizes, cares for, and understands fully those who take refuge and trust in him. We should believe these things even before we see them. Keep me in the way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on. Here are four lessons from the biblical account of Jacob's ladder to both encourage and challenge us. Number one. God uses imperfect people. Like Jacob, we've all failed God and are stained with sin. If God were to exclusively work through people who were sinless, then he would not have any followers today. That is very reassuring to hear. Jacob's faith in the Lord was still inexperienced when he had his first divine experience with God, and he would continue to scheme, lie, and manipulate for several years. But God was still working on him, and Jacob did ultimately mature into a godly man. At the end of his life, he was known as a man of faith. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. Never think that God won't forgive and remake you into the man or woman he's always wanted you to be. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 to 24. 
since all have sinned and continually fall short of the glory of God and are being justified, declared free of the guilt of sin, made acceptable to God and granted eternal life as a gift by His precious undeserved grace through the redemption, the payment for our sin, which is provided in Christ Jesus. Number 2. God's purpose and plan is always better than ours. Early on in his life, Jacob put more faith in his own schemes than he did in the plans that God had for him. Even after he had the prophetic dream, he continued to deceive his uncle Laban, for whom he worked, in order to get what he wanted when he wanted it. But later, while he was making his way back to the country that God had promised him, he had another experience with God. Genesis chapter 32 verses 26 to 30. Then he said, Let me go, for day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing on me. So he asked him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please, tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he declared a blessing of the covenant promises on Jacob there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, the face of God, saying, For I have seen God face to face yet my life has not been snatched away. Jacob finally got it. He was a changed man, with a limp that would always remind him that God was in charge. Sometimes, we figuratively wrestle with God because we're sure we know what's best for us. But God says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Lesson number three, God wants to get our attention. Be inspired by Jacob's account. Hebrews chapter one, verses one to three. God, having spoken to the fathers long ago, in the voices and writings of the prophets, in many separate revelations, each of which set forth a portion of the truth, and in many ways, has in these last days spoken with finality to us in the person of one who is by his character and nature, his son, namely Jesus, whom he appointed heir and lawful owner of all things, through whom also he created the universe, that is, the universe as a space-time-matter continuum. The Son is the radiance and only expression of the glory of our awesome God, reflecting God's Shekinah glory, the light being, the brilliant light of the divine, and the exact representation and perfect imprint of his Father's essence, and upholding and maintaining and propelling all things, the entire physical and spiritual universe, by his powerful word, carrying the universe along to its predetermined goal, when he himself and no other had by offering himself on the cross as a sacrifice for sin, accomplished purification from sins, and established our freedom from guilt. He sat down, revealing his completed work at the right hand of the majesty on high, revealing his divine authority. Lesson number four, God wants trust and obedience. Jacob didn't totally trust God despite this fantastic experience and vision, and he repeatedly trusted in his own devices instead of relying on God. God did protect and provide for Jacob, and he ultimately was able to return home many years later, but only after a wrestling match with God, when God fully blessed him and Jacob finally understood the sovereignty of God. How much easier our lives would be if we lived by trust in and obedience to God.